um, John French. Um, John's a very good author. He's one of my favorites. Who writes paranormal detective fiction? Would that would you say that's accurate, John? Uh, yeah, that's accurate. Yeah, uh, um, paranormal investigator for the uh, Baltimore Police Department, uh, Bianca Jones. Plus, um, like Brian, I have a pulp character who gets involved in the supernatural. Uh, he's called the Nightmare. Oh, nice. And you want to tell them the other part that makes you a particularly interesting writer for detective fiction? <laughs> I am a supervisor in the crime scene unit for the Baltimore City Police Department. And I, back in April, I just did 40 years doing that. Very cool. Congratulations on, on hitting the milestone. Um, I want to remind everybody as we get started that you can call in if you have any questions for John at 609-807. 2492. That's 609-807-2492. Um, I also want to do a quick plug. Um, if you want to support the show, if you've got a couple extra bucks to throw at us, you can go to www.patreon.com slash demonology. Um, that's our Patreon. You can support us with a small monthly amount, you know, even if it's a buck or two. It's helpful. So, um, with all this, that plugging done, uh, let's get the sh show on the road, shall we, guys? Um, so, John, I, I, I'll probably ask you this the first time, but it's, and it is a bit of an obvious question, perhaps. But for our listeners, what drew you to the idea of doing, I mean, the, I think the detective part's fairly obvious, but what drew you to the paranormal side of writing? I learned, when I first started writing, I learned very fast that an editor asked you, can you write this? The only answer is yes. So, um, Vince, Need, Vince Need of Die Monster Die Publication is putting together a zombie anthology called The Dead Walk. And he asked me if I would do a zombie story, so of course I said yes. But because of my background, um, I, ha I wrote a story which featured um, two narcotics detectives whose informant had been killed and the guy, the medical examiner, studied in Haiti, so he brings them back, but they lose them. <laughs> nice. And then I wrote another zombie story about the apocalypse, the end of the world, um, you know, the universe is shrinking, all the good people have been taken up in the rapture, and the rest of us are left behind. And then the dead rise, and one of the newly risen dead walks into the Northeastern District Police Station and asks them to solve his murder. Hmm. That's a good, that's a good opening. Uh, that kind of reminds me of uh, PNL. Rob did a series uh, with a vampire who's a uh, private detective, and the first thing he does is solve his own murder. Yeah, I, I think I remember reading that. Um, yeah, it was a very good series. Then, Jack Fleming. And then somebody, um, I forget who, asked me to write a story for a Mythos collection called Eldritch Blue which was supposed to be um, the mythos and sex. And I went with sex <laughs> as in I went with sex as in reproduction. And uh, the next thing you know, my five foot one badass uh, 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 police detective Bianca Jones uh, came to life on the uh, page. And I've been writing about her ever since. What, what to expect when you're expecting a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, isn't there an Eldritch monster that, that like, supposedly has a ton of kids? Shubnigar off the Stoke with that, the Thousand Young. That was, that, 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 was, that, was, the, that was the <laughs> monster in the first Bianca Jones story. Nice. <laughs> so, so tell us a, a little bit about uh, Bianca. Like, where, did, where did she come from? Where did you get your inspiration uh, Bianca was inspired in part by my daughter. Uh, Bianca's only about five foot, five foot one. Um, my daughter is just about five foot, and she suffers all the she suffered all the problems um, short people have, particularly short women have as they're growing up, um, getting children's menus in the um, and restaurants until you're about fourteen, fifteen people not taking you seriously, that sort of stuff. So she was my, and the way she handled it uh, was my inspiration for Bianca. Bianca's a short woman in the world of very large men, and she's got an attitude. Very nice. And, 
and that that attitude gets her gets her through a lot because she really believes there's nothing she can't she can't stop be it a drug dealer be it a rapist be it a monster from another dimension be it a you know be it a vampire be it the devil himself got to watch out for the short ones <laughs> yeah because they've had to put an outfit put up with <laughs> And they have a lower center of gravity, harder to knock down. Yes. <laughs> Not to mention, depending on how short, they're perfectly lined up for that one punch guys don't like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I definitely always liked Bianca. Um, I want to say that much like um, our other our mutual friend Patrick, uh, a large part of where I first got introduced to your work was reading something written by an, our late friend C.J. Henderson. Right. Um, the one of the, the first collaboration I did was for um, C.J. Henderson's uh, Lay Wan collection, which was called Innocent Monsters, and it teamed Lay Wan with Bianca. And um, not a lot, not a lot of people know this, but the C.J. used to criticize my handling of Bianca. You know, he thought she could be better. He thought she could do better, and that sort of thing. Um, all the words that CJ told me came out of Laywan's mouth directly to Bianca. Nice. So, oh, we wow. sort of worked, so we sort of worked that out on the page. And that story, Innocent Monsters, as I said, appears in his book, his Laywan collection, and my first Bianca collection, Here There Be Monsters. Nice. That's and, awesome. then later, and then later, CJ, um, CJ has a collection called Challenge of the Unknown with your host, Marv Richards. He made me promise to always add that tagline. Um, and um, again, Bianca inter uh, interacts with the host, with Marv Richards, and I got back at him because I put had Bianca hitting, Mar hitting Marv Richards with all my criticism of that character. <laughs> That's very cool. Uh, do you think that's and a little more way? Do you think it's like I got to, and I can save you. <laughs> Turn about as fair play. Yeah, and uh, as I said that story is in CJ's collection, uh, Challenge of the Unknown, and in my new Bianca collection, Monsters Among Us. Well, and sometimes that's, I, I found too, uh, that's like just a really cool way to deal with uh, criticisms or even your own thoughts about where your stories or your characters come up short is to address them directly in the actual story itself and make a, uh, and make a plot point out of it. You were right. I was writing, um, I was writing pulp fiction for um, Tom Johnson, who is a old pulp fan down in Texas, and he would put out, before the Internet, he would put out uh, chapbook magazines done on uh, copying machines. And um, my character was um, a hard-boiled cop known, known as the devil. And he did something incredibly stupid in one of, his, one of the stories. And CJ, of course, pointed this out to me. And so the next, that was the inspiration for the next story, the consequences of him doing something incredibly stupid. <laughs> Makes sense. So who, um, what other authors... I guess, uh, inspire you? Like, what, uh, who did you read that made you want to write this kind of stuff? Um, well, I started, I was actually introduced to detective fiction in high school. Um, the infallible, we actually had readers that included the infallible Godot and Sherlock Holmes and Hercule Poirot. And so, I, you know, I started with the classics. I read a lot of Hercule Poirot, Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot. And then I started discovering Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett, Carol J. Daly, uh, who is the creator of the hard-boiled private eye. And I fashioned a lot of my character, um, The Devil of Harbor City, um, after um, Carol J. Daly's uh, story of uh, character, Satan Hall, who is the toughest cop, toughest cop in the city. And he once arrested somebody just to show he didn't have to kill them all. <laughs> yeah, there's some good stuff from from back in that era. And so when I when I started writing, um, the first the first story I ever wrote was a, a PI story about a private eye who used to be a crime scene investigator. And um, 
the you could you know I you, you could see that the, the Raymond Chandler um, influence in there with a lot of similes and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, and since you know since then I've you know been inspired by well, largely by a lot of the writers I know, uh, Pat Thomas, Jim Chambers, uh, CJ of course, and then. Um, it's just finding my, you know, take, taking what I've read um, and finding my own stuff. Personally, I always enjoy um, it, you know, characters who, for one reason or another, choose not to kill it, because then that forces you to get creative. Yeah, but as much as people say it's a bit of a deus ex machina, and it was, uh, uh, the killing uh, Fire Lord Ozai in Avatar The Last Airbender would have been the easy way out. That would have been that would have been the easy solution. Lady has a point. <laughs> and there, right. there are times um, certainly I think the most obvious example most people would think of, it's like why on earth has if not Batman himself, why has somebody not just put a bullet in the Joker's head by now? <laughs> um I have to yeah, say well, I've read um at least a bit of your nightmare stuff. Because I've read the collection from the Shadows, is it? That you did oh, with Patrick, God. where you did a bunch of the Pulp Era characters? Mm-hmm. Um, I have to, like, um, it was my impression reading it, um, and Patrick's description of it when I had him on before, that the nightmare was the Shadow as played by Brendan Fraser. <laughs> right. That actually described him that, and that's, the, that's one of the blurbs in the book. Uh, um, and um, he's He's obviously fashioned after the spider and the shadow, and um, those who are familiar with the characters will see hints of those people, you know, those crime fighters um, it, it, within the pages, although not mentioned for obvious reasons. And I gave him a more a more lighthearted approach to it. You know, I'm a, I'm I'm a incredibly wealthy person. I'm bored. I have this ability. I might as well go out and fight crime. Dilettante crime fighter. Right, but, you know, he does it with a, you know, matched set of 45s, and unlike the Shadow and the Spider, he's willing to go after the, the supernatural men menaces. Nice. And in the, um, the, there's the, from the Shadows, which is the, you know, the, the collaboration with Pat Thomas, and in his own book, um, The Nightmare Strikes, he actually does cross over with Bianca Jones. In a in a fair in a fairy a fairy man setting, which is the only way I could get the two of them together. Yeah, I was thinking about that. It's like, well, Bianca Jones is a modern character. How it, putting somebody from the pulp era with the modern takes a bit of shoehorning. Yeah, I'm curious, is because I get the impression you're a comic fan. Have you seen them? What are your thoughts on um, Justice League Dark? Just is that the um, is that the DC DVD movie? Yeah. Yeah, it was good, but um, it didn't need Batman. God forgive me. Um, <laughs> but no, I agree with you. Was, I don't think it needed yeah, they Batman, did but it did make good use of him. They yeah. did the same thing with the Salt on Arkham. They have a perfectly good team called the Suicide Squad, and yet they they felt that they had to put Batman in there. Marketing. Well, Assault on Arkham specifically yeah. was it supposed to be a tie-in to the Arkham Arkham series of video games, which I think is part of why they felt that need to shoehorn Batman in. Yeah. Personally, though, my bigger problem with Justice League Dark was um, when Wonder Woman was in the opening and it, how kind of cool she was to this woman who was clearly out of her mind and scared, scared, scared to death, that panicked and not in her right mind. And it's like, that seems a little cool for somebody who's supposed to be all about kindness and, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Compassion. Compassion, yes. That's why it's just as dark. <laughs> yeah, I, I, find, I find a lot of time, I mean, you get different writers for different, for different episodes, for different um, movies, and sometimes they don't quite have a grasp on all the characters, particularly, like, if they're writing Batman and the and and John Constantine and all those sort of things, you know, they're not necessarily Wonder Woman experts. Uh, I suppose uh, 
No, they just it bothered me that Batman and Brandon, who was there during, not after the pact, was acting more compassionate than the superhero who's all about compassion. Yeah. Um and since you mentioned the DC, the, the DVD movies, um, did you, have you seen the newest one, Batman and Harley Quinn? No, I keep meaning to watch that one. Uh, not yet. Uh, yeah, being off the keyboard. It's good, but the ending is a bit, I think the ending is a bit forced. It's sort of like they got to a certain point and they went, all right, what do we do now? <laughs> and Swamp Thing was completely wasted in that. Not drunk wasted, but... You know, although they, that would uh, that would have made the movie, a, movie. <laughs> <laughs> like a, a wasted a wasted swamp thing just tearing around drunk. <laughs> yeah. It's like you know you you, you know you know what I think. <laughs> swamp, swamp thing, go home. You're drunk. I want to go home. I, want, I am home. I am home. This is my home. Everywhere is my home. I am the green. Um. So, uh, I have this. Uh, I, I'm curious of the various supernatural critters you've written about. Which one is your favorite to write for? Um, the the bad guys or the good guys? Either way, really. Okay. Um, as far as um the good guys, um, I've written about by myself and with Pat and with Patrick. I've written about five five um books with Bianca Jones, so she's probably, you know, my favorite of all my monster hunters. As far as the bad guy, as far as the, uh, the bad guys, um, she goes after the devil, she goes after Satan, you know, Lucifer Morningstar. There's three encounters in the first, in, Mon in Here There Be Monsters, and then there's another encounter um, in uh, Monsters Among Us. And just trying to develop a character who is the personification of pure evil and give him some kind of something other than just, I'm evil, I'm going to do bad things to you. You know, you know that, it's interesting playing with that. Pat has his own take on, on, um, on Lucifer, and I have my take. One character I really enjoyed writing, when Pat and I uh, did... Um, Bullets and Brimstone, which crosses Pat, uh, Bianca Jones over with his with his character Negril, who's a forgotten Sumerian god who's now chief of police of hell. Was I did the first draft, and I really got into writing his character Negril. It's one thing when your characters talk to you, but when somebody else's characters talk, start talking to you and telling you what to do, that's scary as hell. <laughs> That, that, that is fascinating. And I, I happen to, aside from the fact that I do love Bianca, I'm definitely a Negro fan. It's like having him sit down and go, okay, so look, this is what you're going to do, just does seem very unsettling. Yeah, and the fact that, um, the fact that he, um, he emulates Humphrey Bogart just is, is icing on the cake. Nice. <laughs> yes, the, the C Hell's chief of police acts like Humphrey Bogart. Well, because why would you? Well, exactly. Even, even chaos needs some order. <laughs> so I have, a, I have a question that this uh, might hopefully lead into some other stuff and tie in. How much does your, your I guess, day job as a forensic investigator, uh, how does that tie into your writing? Like how much inspiration do you get for your stories out, um, of, out of your work? There's very little, I've gotten maybe one or two stories that are based on things that have actually happened. Um, come back to that. But, you know, um, generally it's, you know, you're going after a monster, you're going after, you know, a demon or something like that. What can the police do? You know, how would, you know, how would, how would this work in a practical world? If you're going after a werewolf, what can you do to, like, for instance, um, Hildy Silverman is going to be publishing a Bianca Jones story in her in her magazine. It's called Beast in Show. It's a werewolf at a dog show. <laughs> I think you and may have mentioned the story once before. Werewolf DNA. How do you separate the wolf 
from the human, and basically you use wolf bait. Um, but, you know, I try to apply forensic techniques to these supernatural things. Nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm just assuming that this is one of the less uh, crazy dog shows where every dog has to be like this certain uh, abnormality in breeding. No, 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 this is a, this is a, this is based on, uh, well, um, one of my um, guilty pleasures is after the Thanksgiving parade is over, I like to watch the dog show afterwards. <laughs> I've, been watch, I've been watching dog shows ever since I saw Best in Show. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah, so That's you see hilarious. where the title comes from. It was, and this it was is done, a it was dog show. Oh, sorry. I was, I was and, just going to explain uh, to Kevin this, what it was. This is a legitimate. Sorry, this is a legitimate dog show, and it's basically hiding in plain in plain sight. There's a werewolf who is, you know, involved with the dog show, even though the it's not a dog show featuring supernatural canines. Although that would be funny. That, that's another way to take off. Now like, I'm just imagining like a just, dog show meets one of those like muscle and, you know, model things. Well, yeah, it's like a werewolf no. dog show. Cerebus, you know, who's, who's the best and a werewolf. And yeah. who's a strong man. Hell yeah. or two. Exactly. And, and who's, who can pull an tra actor trailer with their teeth. The tailor, the, the talent competition, mm. you know. I mean, that would be, <laughs> well, there's a story idea. <laughs> and you, story can, you, can involve, you can involve other dogs. Um, there's the uh, Celtic bar guest. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Bar I've used it, I've used the bar guest a couple of times, and um, there's um, if you bring in Cerebus, um, is that one dog or three? It's it's one dog. It's got three heads, <laughs> and its name means yeah. Spock. That that's yeah. possibly my favorite fact about Cerebus. Yes, is Hades, Lord of the Dead, King of the Underworld, called his dog Spock. This is another reason why I never considered Hades to be that bad of a guy when no. I actually read folklore, no, not, not just to watch the Hercules from Disney. Yeah, no, but if you haven't seen it, Best in Show is hilarious. It's a it's a mockumentary about a dog show done by the guys who did Spinal Tap. <laughs> so it, it's oh, it's just uproariously funny. Like just it makes it skewers the whole culture and. And the format, it's just great. Can I break in for a minute? Yeah, go ahead. If you can hear me, everybody, um, we're going to try to get a chat room up for you to answer. I just was talking to my webmaster. We put a chat room up for you. Okay, fantastic. Uh, and I, when I talked to him, my webmaster, his mother knew he were. She was in Ohio. She knows who Kevin Mears is. Oh, wow. I was really excited. I was like, oh, that's really cool. She says, well, she's friends with somebody in Great Britain that's also a demonologist. But she says, you know her as Marcy something. She used to be here in New Jersey, so I I know she used to listen to the show, I guess, and she's tuning in now. Oh so wow! Give her a shout out. Hello uh, out there, um, Ohio. <laughs> we're at about the half hour mark, so it's probably a good time to give the phone number again. Yes, uh, folks, you are welcome to call in six zero nine eight zero seven two four nine two six zero nine eight zero seven two four nine two. Feel free to call in if you get questions for John or any of us. Um, if you have anything you want to contribute, well. We're always welcoming new callers, and I want to, again, shamelessly self-plug the Patreon. Remember, patreon.com slash demonology. Um, we could definitely use the support. The show's about an hour drive for Amisha and I, so there's some, there's some real expense that goes into getting this going. Also, if you want to, uh, if you're a small business owner or anything and you want to advertise on Hamilton Radio for this show or any of the others, uh, contact Gene. There's... Uh, many opportunities there. It's very reasonably priced. Yeah, but if you don't know how to reach Gene, you can always you can go to the Patreon. There's ways to set it up there where you can contact me. Myself will definitely hook you up. My email is admin, A-D-M-I-N at HamiltonRadio.net. So you there guys you know, it's real simple. You can put it up on the screen. I will. <laughs> yeah. Operators are standing by. <laughs> All now. <laughs> That is sort of the guilt, because I feel a bit like um, those telethon people. Back I was just going to say, we should do this, we, we should do like a mock telethon one of these days, and just, you know, we can we can trot out like sick vampires to be, you know, like, 
<laughs> you know, mate, werewolves with mange no, and whatnot. No, like, please, very entertaining and cool. Please, please donate. <laughs> donate to these poor starving vampires. You dress up like Jerry Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> I can get you to do a reading. I can do some yeah. magic tricks. Exactly. Yeah, we we got think, lots of friends doing party in the school area. Halloween telephone. I think this could be a thing. <laughs> I, I I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we haven't lost you yet, John. <laughs> no, I'm still here. Excellent. So let's see. I do I do want to say I like. I, I happen to definitely be a fan of Patrick's interpretation of the devil. Um, but I like, I, and for that matter, I'm a fan of yours as well. Just because, you know, this is my bailiwick as a demonologist. And so many writers make him so sympathetic. And it's like, no, 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 he's evil. And I love the fact you get that. Blame Bill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's the problem I think with a lot of movies these days and literature. I mean, Hannibal Lecter was one of the best movie villains and you know, novel villains that I, I've read. And then they had to go and then Thomas Harris had to go and give him an origin story, which, you know, Don't explained a little bit about why yeah, he's like that. Yeah, basically. And his, Oh, it was and it it so culinary piece. Um, and then they had to go explain Darth Vader. Which itself mm -hmm. isn't necessarily a bad thing. They just handled it horribly. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, the thing about villainy is, you know, they're villains. They're bad. They're evil. Any explanation of how they got there basically gives them, you know, it basically builds sympathy for them and makes them a little less evil. Oh, you know what we, we seem to be in. We seem to be in an era of um, there are no villains anymore; just misunderstood people. We have more anti-heroes than villains, and I think um, one great um, example of that is um, the TV show Lucifer. I have to admit I enjoyed the show, but I definitely see your point. Yeah. I'm just curious if you know what the trope, the Freudian excuse is. The what? The what? The Freudian excuse is a trope where you take a villain and it, you give them a sympathetic backstory like, oh, their parents didn't love them enough. Or, they were abused. Or they were abused classic. or they were bullied. They did it. They did it. They did it. They did it. That's a, supposed to give them sympathy, but at the same time, we're supposed to root against them. It's kind of confusing. Yeah, I think it. a, a lot of it, I think, stems, for one, uh, it started a lot in the 60s and 70s when uh, psychology really uh, came into vogue. And people in books and movies, suddenly, they didn't want, they didn't want just a bad guy who was bad for the sake of being bad. They wanted an explanation. They, they got interested in, well, what made him that way? Why did he become bad? Like with, with Norman Bates is, is a great example. He's a fantastic character and he's, he's actually in the, in the book, he's a horrible character and he's, he's not really at all sympathetic. The movie, largely because of Anthony Perkins portrayal, made Perkins, him... It's not Perkins. Huh? Anthony Perkins? Perkins, yeah. Oh, Norman, Norman, Norman Bates. Bates. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Hannibal Lecter, so. yeah. Uh, Sorry. You, you, although you know, fun side fact, Anthony Perkins was originally considered for Hannibal Lecter. They wanted to uh, use him. Uh, but, uh, but to get back to the point, the idea of somebody just being evil, I think part of it, we, we started to look at that as being a cop-out excuse that you know, the mustache twirling villain who is who is just evil for the sake of being evil. I think you can have that compromise where you can explain someone's motives without necessarily and the problem redeeming the, or, or undercutting everything. There's a done. cut song from the movie Aladdin, and I'm so glad they cut because it, it is that excuse in a nutshell. It'll, it'll, and it gets to far, it's like... It, 
tragic backstory and I'm sitting there and I'm going, hey, you don't need to give him a tragic backstory. He wants power. That's a simple enough motive. Although that, that particular plot, that never made any sense because Jafar already had power. He was already pretty he much... More power. He was, he was greedy for power. Yeah, but he was running the Sultan like a puppet. He, he had, already had the power. Exactly. Yeah. There was no reason for him to do anything else. And he, yeah. but Except that somebody who's power hungry, if he sees um, the opportunity to get even more power, why bother... You know, why settle for running a country when with the genie, you can run the world? Oh, yeah, I can see him wanting the genie, but the, the whole usurping the, the sultan's position is like, why? When you, already <laughs> run the, when you already run the country, why do you need to publicly run the country? Exactly. Yes, absolutely. I want to run the whole world as a logical upgrade of power. Sure. It just, when you already have it, why do you need to make it official? And then, this is, is something thing that I realized when I was like, 13, 14, it's, 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 wow, why do we need uh, all these villains to have, like, these explanations and everything? Well, I think the problem, and John, feel free to back me up or call me on this if I'm wrong, because it falls into your, probably more in your area of expertise. When you look at people, especially with the more, some of the people with psychopathy and sociopathy, you know, the ser more serious serial killers, some of them just do it because they derive pleasure from hurting people. Sure. They don't need a deeper reason. Right, you know, that it's either that or um it, it makes it makes them even though they're not in, uh the, the, the serial killers that I've been I haven't been involved with them directly, but I have worked some serial killer cases. Um, they're more pathetic than anything else. Yeah, they're they're evil and they're murderers, but um they're you know, they're, they're trying to get something, they're trying to get recognition in a way that, you know, no one will ever, you know, as far as they're concerned, no one will ever appreciate. You know, I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to be special, and uh, for the most part, nobody ever remembers their name. And I think that might, I mean, I know we can't do that in our society, but that might be one of the, the ultimate punishments for a serial killer is that... Um, no one will ever mention your name again. Yeah. Oh, t I've had that same thought. It's like, do you really want to get at these people? Give them no media coverage. Don't write books about them. Just let them languish in obscurity in a prison cell somewhere. Yeah, and most I, of them do, sadly. I mean, there's so many that you never hear of. I'm curious if you ever heard of a movie called The Cell. No. It's a terrible artsy movie that's supposed to be a character study, and I forgot to put in the character. There, there, it <laughs> oh, yeah. Je Jennifer, the backstory yeah. is, Jennifer Lopez goes into the mind of Vincent D'Onofrio, uh, who plays the serial killer, and, and they get to do all kinds of weird, crazy costumes and, and the fun sets and things. Yeah, but they forgot to put <laughs> substance into all the oh, yeah. costuming and... Because, or at least because substance it was a that music, wasn't obvious. It was a music video director making his you know, film debut, so it was, it was going to be a lot of lavish visuals. But uh, to, to bring it back a little bit to John, how, how would you describe then, uh, since Kevin uh, opened the door for this, uh, your, your take on Lucifer and how that ties into our discussion of villains? All right. Uh, my, my view of Lucifer is he is, first of all, most people, you know, people forget that he's an angel. He had it all. You know, he was one or two steps away from God. And um, it's his, his main sin, and Bianca's a little guilty of this herself, is pride. And that led, you know, and that led to his downfall. And he could, at any time, you know, say to God, I'm sorry, can I come home? But his pride keeps him from doing that, and it might make him, a, it doesn't make him any less evil, um, but it does make him uh, more Miltonian in that it, you know, it's the, um, you know, it, that, it, that it's his fatal flaw. And not only is it, you know, it does, not only does it keep him from redemption, it keeps him from under, it keeps him continually underestimating us, humans. That's one of the things. There's always, 
he makes these elaborate plans and then forgets to, uh, and then figures that he's better than we are, and then and and but somehow he makes a mistake that brings him down. He is part of his damnation is that he will always make that mistake. He will always underestimate his opponent. He, you know, no matter how how initially he how initially successful he is. He's always doomed to failure. Nice. And it is, I think it fits very well, again, coming at this from my perspective, with your description of, of serial killers. Of their, I, not that I'm particularly sympathetic with Satan by any possible stretch of the imagination, but I do think there is this element of he had everything he, anyone could ever want, and he threw it away for the stupidest possible reasons. And right. there's a verse, and I don't remember it off the top of my head, I am trying to look it up, but there's a verse in Revelations that actually talks very much about that, where um, during his judgment he's dragged out you know, before the world, and um, it's just like, wait, this is Satan, this is the one who deceived the world? Well, it gives it that, I, I think the reason that that version of Satan and Milton's take on it has always uh, kind of great. It's the same reason that some of the Greek myths resonate is, is because it's got that element of tragedy, that, that little seed of self-destruction planted within, you know, where someone who could have been so great, you know, kind of just has that one little flaw that brings, brings it all down. And, and that's, I think that's always a great story that resonates with people because we, we kind of relate to it. You know, we we know people <laughs> that that happens to. We too. know it in uh, ourselves too. Yeah, we feel yeah. yes. Yeah, we, and it, it it's one thing that people misunderstand about it, writing complex characters in that it, you don't need to give them these super sobby sympathetic backstories. You just need to give them it, something. Deep that we recognize on an emotional level. A, a strong motivation is, is better than a convoluted backstory in most cases with, with characters, right. I think. Yeah. And I, I think the best example of that is um, you're probably familiar with um, Maxwell Grant Walt, slash Walter Gibson's character, The, the Shadow. Naturally. Yeah. Okay. Well, except for some vague hints. Walter Gibson never gave the shadow an actual origin. He's just the shadow. Which actually sometimes works better if you keep a character mysterious. The reader is free to interpret and, and put their own ideas onto what that character might be. And it, it, I think it, it makes, uh, makes for stronger... I think one of the reasons that Stoker's version of, of Dracula and his creation of that character has stuck around for so long is because the character is so malleable. You know, you see him in the modern day, there's a few, or at that time in the modern day, there's a few references to, you know, potential historical origins or things that he may have had, you know, a few throwaway lines here and there. But for the most part, Dracula is just his actions. You know, he's, he is what you see him do, and there's not a lot of uh, philosophizing about who and what he is. Yeah. Unless you want to right. do that, and then usually box it up horribly, like that Dracula origin movie they tried to do. Oh, well, and that's, and that's what I mean. It. When, when, you try to, when you try to take a, a character like that, that's what uh, we were talking about before, when you try to take a character like that, and explain everything and lay out all the same. Usually, all it does is it diminishes that character well, because you've taken away the mystery. It doesn't just take away from the mystery. If you ever see that movie, it's oh, like, I, I saw it. Yeah. I fell asleep. Yeah, yeah. It, it's we just like, turned it off. We, we've never yeah. not seen this in I saw a dozen it in the other movies, oh, I'm books sorry. and yeah. video games. Doug yeah. Petter. Yeah, I saw it in the theaters. Yeah. We couldn't stay awake for it. <laughs> Once you take the mystery all out of something, it becomes ordinary. The yeah. Lone Ranger without his mask is just another cowboy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think the obvious example, and John, as you've said earlier, you've written for this 
I'll just call it the mythos, but the Lovecraftian creatures. One of the reasons Cthulhu works so well, in my opinion, in the original stories is just the fact it's there. It's this ancient horror from beyond space-time. You don't need a 20-page backstory. Yeah, you, you never yeah. find out about Cthulhu's tragic childhood. And... <laughs> <laughs> and, although that, that brings the, me to an yeah. interesting thought. We're talking about yeah. like evil characters who are evil because uh, that's what they want. That's what they are. They're, uh, and not just thinking about the flip side, and with good characters, that's who they are. That's what they try and do. It, you know, because I'm thinking about that Lone Ranger movie at Disney, then it's like, hey, they try to make them this comic nickel and goofball, and it's like, why? What What was wrong um, with having this character who just wanted to do the right thing and just wanted to help people, you know, just wanted to do it because it was the right thing to do? Yeah. And, and again, even like Batman, the more you the more you tear apart and examine Batman's origin, you start seeing the holes in it. You start, it starts falling apart. Batman works better when you just kind of accept that, you know, okay, it's, it's a rich guy that puts on a costume and he goes out and fights crime. Why? Because his parents were killed. Okay, good enough. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, because yeah. yeah, that's the thing that people need to remember. Batman isn't his vengeance. He's our vengeance. And so and, he's and not doing this yeah. for everybody else. And that's a common theme, mostly in the pulps, um, when comic books are really the um, the heirs to the old pulp, pulp fiction. Um, what motivates most of the characters is, possible, the possible exception of the shadow and, you know, those, is that there is either a need for vengeance or a need for justice. Um, a lot of the less less known, lesser known um, pulp heroes have had some kind of tragedy in their life and they're going out to avenge that. Um, you know, the domino lady who is, has been taken far beyond her original, you know, the original concept, but she, she put on the mask and the slinky gown in order to um, catch the criminals who killed her father. Yeah. Yeah, it's just an interesting thing to think about because like it, Going with the uh, DC Cinematic Universe they're trying to make, it, before Wonder Woman, it's it, kind of clear that uh, Zack Snyder doesn't really understand why a hero would want to do good because this is the right thing to do. So, uh, unlike yeah. with uh, Wonder Woman, who we see, she wants to do good because that's the, the right thing to do. That's what she knows. That's, 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 that's what she wants to do with her life. Although that, that's yeah. one example where I would, I would say that helps to prove uh, the, the flip side is Wonder Woman is one of those characters that I honestly never found all that interesting. Like, I never really got what Wonder Woman was about other than she was a chick with a magic lasso and, and <laughs> bracers. Like, I never knew what made Wonder Woman tick. And then going and seeing the new movie where it actually did give her a background suddenly I was like, okay, you know, the, the, the penny dropped. I was like, I get Wonder Woman now. I know what's, what's going on, and now she is interesting. Although I think John's character, Bianca, is a real obvious example of if some people do the right thing because it's the right thing. She's a cop, for goodness sakes. Mm -hmm. yep. Right, and she, she's, a, she's a cop. What, I mean, but despite all the monsters she's faced, um, to her, they're just... You know, each monster is just another perp who has to be taken down. <laughs> and I know you've written stories with her with things that weren't monsters. I have the one you you were kind enough to send when we had you on before, where she was dealing with the um, terrorists. Right. Um, I wanted to do a... Well, I've done Bianca stories with without monsters. Well, without supernatural monsters. There's always a monster. Well, yeah. But... Um, you know, I I got the I got the idea for you know, you know these terrorists and um, part of that was fired by the IRA. They had car bombs, but they forced um, they forced Protestants into driving them because uh, better one of them dies than one of them one of uh, one of us, you know, attitude. Mm -hmm. But um, so I wanted to see if I could keep Bianca in that same universe where she is a monster hunter but not have any apparent um, 
supernatural. Um, that story um, is one of the stories in Monsters Among Us, and it ties into, you know, the, the character, uh, the bright one, is the, is the main villain in, in, in that book. And the bright one sort of came in as sort of a, a thought. Of the first story in there is called The Case of the Cursed Weenie. <laughs> and um, they, it's based on a somewhat true story that could have only happened in Baltimore. And in it, the, 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 bad, the bad guy in that book mentions the bright one, but there's no explanation for the bright one. And then later, the villain in um, Choice of Damnations mentions the bright one. You know, so, and that kind of leads to the ultimate, um, you know, confrontation between Bianca and the, the person who is the bright one. See, I now remember thinking about the story about the cursed weenie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that was a... Um, some years ago, Baltimore had a was hit with a double blizzard. I think the whole East Coast was hit by a double blizzard. Mm -hmm. And shortly after, now there's a custom in Baltimore that if you have if you park on the street and you dig your car out from the snow, you get to mark the spot with traffic cones, lawn chairs, with anything. And those those are sacred. The, you know, it's against the law, but the mayor says. Custom beats the law in this case. You you know you do not lose somebody else's lawn chairs. So we had a double blizzard. We had this lawn chair tradition, and without going into too much detail, I had a case that involved a voodoo doll. <laughs> and the um, and the note attached to the voodoo doll read, "Your weenie is cursed." <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Can't, and I'm, you can't make this stuff up. I think, if I can't get a story out of a cursed weenie in a double blizzard in Baltimore, shame on me. And this, and this was <laughs> over a stolen parking spot? Over you know, a stolen, oh yeah, stolen, stolen, stolen uh, out the, parking spot. An argument over oh. a parking spot does, um, does involve, it is involved. Nice. And all the elements all the elements are involved. And a funny story about that, I was doing a reading at the at the Balticon back on Memorial Day weekend, and I had picked knowing knowing the crowd at the Balticon. I had, and since Monsters Among Us was a new book, um, I had picked that story to read from. And everything was going good until the fourteen-year-old girl walked in. <laughs> no, can't read that book anymore. So I, I read from I read from C.J. Henderson's uh, actually. Um, just around the Balticon, C.J. Henderson's uh, book, the fairy tale of uh, Jack and Her Beanstalk, uh, came out. Um, came out, and I was fortunate enough to be uh, the editor of that. So I had that with me, so I read that. <laughs> Not as funny, but more age appropriate. Right. Yeah. I say let them take their chances. If they wander in, they get what they get. <laughs> Yeah, but you have to. Um, they, 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 at, at the end, after everybody had read, um, we did re launch into an interesting conversation as to whether or not a Orthodox Jewish dragon could eat a cow. Interesting. Because since the cow has milk and you're not allowed to mix dairy and meat, could an Orthodox Jewish dragon eat, um, eat a cow? Maybe, maybe just the front half. Well, actually, it's not really milk until it comes out. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's an interesting. I was going to say, there could be a whole argument about kosher, kosher butchering there. And, you know. uh, I would say maybe you can only eat it full. I was going to say, the other one I remember um, talking about with you before that you, invo you involved was, that's another Baltimore classic, is Black Aggie. Right, that's... Um, when um, I was asked to do, a, after The Dead Walk came out, um, Vince Need came up with a concept of, the theme of the book was women and monsters. You could have women monsters, you could have women fighting monsters. Um, as long as there was a woman, and as long as there was a monster, you were good. 
And um, thinking women and monsters, I came up with my second Bianca Jones story, which was called 21 Doors, after a really creepy um, sleepover game my daughter used to play with her friends. And um, I incorporated the, the Ouija board, and Baltimore was the center for, for Ouija. Um, and I incorporated the Baltimore legend of Black Aggie for everyone else. It, it's a lot like the legend of Bloody Mary. The difference is there is a, there was in Pikesville, Maryland, a statue called Black Aggie and all sorts of weird things um, were attributed to that. Like if you, if, um, if you slept in the shadow of the Black Aggie statue, you wouldn't wake up. Um, if you took your date to Black Aggie and um, the shadow crossed her, you were going to get lucky that night. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of legends uh, that that are attached to Bloody Mary um, were attached to Black Aggie, and it got so bad they actually moved the statue out of the Pikesville Cemetery and moved it into a hidden garden in Washington, D.C., where the evil would be less noticeable. <laughs> it's D.C., come on. The, 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 there's yeah. already so much evil there, it's barely a blip on the radar. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, that's why I had to There really was a black Aggie statue, and uh, all those three things combined, and it gave me, uh, the resolution of that story actually gave me a theme that I could carry through a couple of other Bianca Jones stories. Nice. Now, a friend of mine who does um, various rituals like Black Aggie and the, tw and the 21 Doors uh, did a related ritual called the Doors of Perception on YouTube. There are interesting little things in this psychological exercise, for lack of a better word where you go into this hall, you, know, you envision going into this hallway as almost a guided meditation and opening right, that, various doors. Go ahead. I'm sorry, what was that? I said that, that's what, that's 21 doors, but it, it was played as a um, sleepover game. Yeah, I love this. It's, it's a weird psychological experiment, I suppose, and they do it as a sleepover game. Yep. Yeah. Well, you, you know, I mean, Parker Brothers sells, you know, the Ouija board right right next to Clue and Monopoly, and, you know, it has has little, you know, oh, you know, fun for all ages, you know. <laughs> True. You know, so what are you, you going to do? Some some people would say, oh, it's a, it's a joke. You you obviously have had experiences that say otherwise. Yeah. So, Go to hell and take your family with you. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> exactly. Why? So you you got to wonder, like, you know, what what would it take? How many documented cases would it take for them to, to like, pull Ouija boards from? More from than like just ads. Yeah. Because here's the thing. Yeah. There are, like, documented to the point of people who wound up in psychiatric institutions. And not, we're not talking about an insignificant number. After fooling around with those boards, and they're still on the shelves. Whereas I've actually played with yeah. the Ouija board, you know, with um, me and friends, and nothing really came of it, so. I've always been uncomfortable yeah. around them, but I've done it too when I was a kid. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, a couple that. of years ago, a yeah. couple of years ago, on the 150th anniversary of the Ouija board, um, in Baltimore, they held the Ouija Con. <laughs> which was a, um, I got a table there. I did not do well because I think they could tell I was not a true believer. But um, it was an interesting experience in that um, I learned that all Ouija's are talking boards, but not all talking boards are Ouija boards. And uh, the man next to me had designed a his own talking board with the guidance of his spirit guide. And... Um, you know, he was, he, you know, he was, it was interesting to talk to. It was, it, I, I learned a lot about the, um, you know, the, the, the whole talking board thing. The guy from Oddity, if you remember that show. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was there. Um, the normal one. Uh, <laughs> and 
And um, we, did, we did have an interesting discussion as to whether or not you could do a talking board reading over Skype. Hmm. Um, I'm actually I, contemplating that question. I dove into my um, science background and pointed out that you, since you have uh, quantum particles, that if separated, you know, even though they're separated, what you do to one is reflected into the other, and if it works in physics, it should work in the spiritual world. Yeah, I've, I've heard that uh, theory that actually backs well, well, they, goes toward a lot. They don't talk about that so much with Ouija, but I've heard that a lot with psychics. And the fact that there are, well, well, it's a long way from proof. There are certainly explanations within quantum theory that would account for some psychic ability. Particularly, yeah. usually telepathy and remote viewing. Because like you said, what happens to one thing can affect something else even when they're separated over a distance. Anyway, a little a little delve into quantum mechanics, and that seemed to, that seemed to uh, satisfy everybody, so that they they felt comfortable doing a reading over 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 Skype. Yeah, as, as an investigator, I think it could work. I'm not going to recommend anybody do it. What if you wound up with a possessed computer? <laughs> Aren't they already? <laughs> well, that's yeah. what I mean. How would you know? But you know, what if you suddenly you've got a demon in your in your machine? The exorcist I used to work for, who was from Baltimore for a while, you know, he had lived in Baltimore for quite a while, actually, kept the statue of St. Michael on his computer. <laughs> actually, um, the unofficial patron saint of computers and the Internet is St. Isidore of Seville. I thought, that's interesting. I thought it was Gabriel. Didn't know that. No, um, St. Isidore was a, uh, he, lived too, he lived so far back, you know, there were no computers or anything like that. But he compiled um, a library of what he believed to be all the information in the world. So, yeah, who else? Who? Uh, what other uh, saint would, uh, would 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 qualify? Saint Jude. Excuse me. Whoever the saint of <laughs> pornography. No, that's. that's <laughs> the one. Yeah, but the thing about Saint Isidore is not not a lot of people know about him, and so there's no waiting line to you know when you, when you pray to him, you don't you don't really get put on hold. Oh, that, that's that's true. Good to know. You want to know those ones that don't have a huge amount? Yeah, of, he's happy to hear from you. You know, yeah. he doesn't get called up a lot. Patron Saint of Google. You know, you go with like Patrick or Gabriel or Michael. Everybody prays to them, but you got the Saint Isidore. Nobody knows who they are. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Any other questions, you two? Not that I can think of. Uh, well, when when did you start writing? <laughs> uh, I'll ask some um, of the obvious, I obvious questions. About, I guess around 1988, um, 19, you know, somewhere around there. I know my first my first professional uh, published story was about 1992. It was in uh, Gary Levisi's Hard Boiled Magazine. Um, it was, it introduced my character, Matthew Grace, at the time I didn't know he was going to be a series character, um, but um, he, was my, he was my first series character, and he, his, 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 he's a crime scene for this collection of stories about a crime scene investigator who midway through the book leaves the department and becomes a private eye. So um, it's, you know, it's sort of CSI with all the facts straight. <laughs> there you go. Oh, so do you have any interesting uh, stories from that side of your profession? Uh, just the obviously ones you can talk about, right? Right, just something. Well, like actually, something I'm fun. I'm not real comfortable talking about that sort of thing because um, I never know what case is open and what case isn't. Oh, okay, fair enough. Which is a very legitimate answer to that question. We don't how, want to how completely how completely wrong is Dexter? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a good story about Dexter on the now I I know a little bit about blood stain pattern analysis. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a Sherlock Holmes story for one of Gary Levisi's um, uh, Sherlock Holmes anthologies, and in it Sherlock is standing in a room doing blood stain pattern analysis because I figure if I can do it, Sherlock can do it. Mm -hmm. 
what, and I've talked to other people who know more about blood stain pattern analysis than I do, mm -hmm. and we all agree the poster of the, for the second season of Dexter, who is a blood stain pattern expert, yes, got the blood spatter wrong. That's that's not uh, hard wrong, to believe. It's all going in the wrong direction. Yeah. Well, it's marketing. It's not science. <laughs> yeah, but if you're going to do it, you know, take the time to do that little bit right there. Sure. Do your homework. I just meant, like, on the do show and, and the, uh, like, some of the stuff that he does. Like, did they get any of it right? You know, 60% right? I read the first Dexter book, um, and that wasn't bad, but it seemed a bit... Um, derivative of a couple of other other books I was reading at the time, mm -hmm. and um, I didn't watch the show because at the time I didn't have Showtime. Wow. What was funny is I actually I watched the show and I went and I read the book. And normally the book is always better. I actually think the show was better than uh, than the books. In, in that case, I didn't find the. I mean, the guy was obviously, he was a cop who decided to write. I, he was probably a better cop than he was an author, uh, which I, you know, which is not a slam, but it's just, I didn't find the book nearly as interesting. I thought they actually expanded on the characters and made the plot more interesting in the, uh, the first season when it translated it. It was it was a more solid story, so I have to agree with you on that one. Yeah. Um, I read I read the first book. I think I started the second book. Yeah, it's just not that compelling. I know they got supposedly got really weird later in the series. Let's say he was like possessed by a demon. Yes, they they started to get his dark passenger was actually some ancient you know demon or something that had a cult, and, and I just went okay, I'm I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I'm out. Actually, the one concept um, that, that I got out of Dexter is that I believe, if I remember, his father saw what kind of person Dexter was going to be, so he steered him toward his path of preying on other killers. Yes. That was the interesting there part is, of that. There is a crime, crime series by uh, a woman named Carol O'Connell who writes about a detective named Mallory. Um, Mallory um, was a street kid who was adopted by a cop, and right away he saw that she had all the makings of a sociopath, and so he steered her toward police work. And now she's a very scary, very effective police detective for New York City's major crime unit. And the first novel is called Mallory's Oracle, and there's, there's several books. There's quite a few books in the series, but Mallory is a fascinating character. And I think I like her because even though I was writing Bianca Jones before I discovered Mallory, um, there's a little bit of Mallory in Bianca and a little bit of Bianca in Mal Mallory, even though Mallory is a drop-dead, gorgeous, blonde, tall blonde, and Bianca is any, none of those things. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's always fun when you, when you, find, you, you find something that, that kind of mirrors your own work. There was a there was another series like that. Um, and I'm blanking on the the author's name, but it was an FBI agent who uh, profiled and chased after serial killers. And the his his dark secret was that he had the reason he was so good at it was because he felt that kind of. Uh, thrill of, of the hunt and, and had sort of a a slight, you know, serial killer aspect to him. He never, he didn't deliberately go out and kill people, but he tapped into that part of himself and it, it allowed him to, uh, to understand and empathize with uh, the killers that he chased. It's an interesting thought experiment, especially when you just keep in mind that, you know, people that are sociopaths and psychopaths a lot of them don't actually become serial killers. They find no. something else to channel those tendencies into. The the common examples, of course, being business and politics. Right. Well, some of them just aren't naturally violent. I mean, they're, yeah. they they have as wide a range of interests and, and whatnot as, as anybody else. They just lack that uh, certain emotional capacity. 
And of course, um, for that matter, the recent one of many adaptations of Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock. Yeah. yeah. Although I would high disagree with the concept of Sherlock. Every season, Sherlock says, I'm a high functioning sociopath. And then usually yeah. should well, first of all, somebody had, to, somebody had to call him a psychopath. Yeah, because he's not a sociopath. So that, he can correct, so that he can correct him and say, I'm a highly functional sociopath. Yep. Um, my favorite episode, my favorite use of that was when he was talking to John Watson's fiance's ex-boyfriend. <laughs> you know, and basically warning him off in the most polite way he could without actually beating him. It was good. It's a good show. I mean, I like that. Was, that I was like Benedict. Excellent series. Yeah, I like Benedict. Um, very close trail. to the Holmes canon. Um, I, and on the other hand, I watched about 20 minutes of Elementary and turned it off and never watched it yeah, again. Yeah, I can't say Elementary. I've watched it once or twice. I'm not going to say I hate the show, but I prefer Sherlock. Although, I, I have to admit, growing up, like, the first fandom I joined was the Sherlock fandom as a kid. So th there are parts of me that loves the series Sherlock, and there's parts of me that just go, no, 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 no. Particularly, I can't stand. Usually, I, at times I like it, but on the whole, I find Jim Moriarty's portrayal really annoying. <laughs> it took it took some growing. I I didn't like it at first either because I'm so used to the traditional Moriarty. But after after a while, like by the time we got to the the current season, and, and now he's you know we know he's dead and stuff. I I got to where I could accept it because I saw what they were doing and what they were doing was you know they had a modern Sherlock and they wanted to give him a counterpoint that was a very modern Moriarty that wasn't uh, the traditional kind of which isn't a bad you know, thing I just that, that wasn't the way to go but the well the Guy Ritchie movies uh, did did a much better job with yes him, if, if you like the traditional Moriarty, I thought, uh, I thought Jared, uh, what was it, uh, I'm blanking on the name. I do want to give the number again for folks, um, <laughs> if anybody wants to call in, 609-807-2492, that's 8609-807-2492, um, we do accept callers if anybody has a question. If you need a country call, it's the number one, put it in front of it. Thank you, sweetie. Oh yeah, that's right. We we are we are international. I keep forgetting that we've got people all over. And I do want to say hello to our international friends out there. Um, what's up, Germany? <laughs> <laughs> and, and for that matter, for the record, for people who may have difficulty finding physical copies, I believe you're. I, I have at least two of your books, John, as um Kindle books. Right. There's a lot of my books are in Kindle and. Pat Thomas and Pat Wolf are working on bringing some more, more on the Kindle. Um, so just, uh, I know the newest Bianca Monsters Among Us is available on Kindle. So they can people can get them on Amazon. Right. Okay. Good. That's uh, good to know where you can get the books. Which is worth saying as well. Um, John, do you have anything? Uh, uh, you've mentioned Monsters Among Us. Is is there anything else you've got coming out or out? In, that's all already you'd like to give a promotion to? Okay, I've, um, I'm developing a new supernatural investigator. His name is Simon Toombs. Uh, Pat Thomas has described him as Harry Dresden meets the saint. <laughs> and um, his, the first Simon Toombs story will be in Rick Leader's Hellfire Lounge 6, Wheeling and Dealing, which features deals with the devil. <laughs> I really wish you could have seen it, Kevin's face when you were describing it, the well, character. Like, I'm a Dresden fan, but he will if he, if he, he will if he sees the video. <laughs> <laughs> true. Come back, come back and watch the video. Um, and um, true as, you know, I took Rick very seriously when he said deals with the devil. I have Simon um, engaged in a, in a high-stakes card game with a demon. <laughs> Nice. So he's literally dealing with it. <laughs> right. That's right. awesome. I'm just trying to remember. But it's the devil dealing from the bottom of the deck. 
Oh no, that's, that, um, and this, you know, the the, the thing about, um, you know, the thing about my demons is that they they will cheat you, but they will play by the rules while doing so. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to remember they, they, what was the game. They will hang you on a point. They won't. They won't cut. They won't double. They won't deal from the bottom of the deck, but they will hang you on a point of grammar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, the uh, basically. What somebody would, I think it was you playing Gary Gygax, and at one point it became the, the oh, right. Dragons game for the fate of the universe. Um, Trail of Cthulhu, which is a role playing game, of course, based on the mythos. And it was a bunch of classic individuals from the 70s so Gary Gygax, Hillary Clinton, um, what's his name, Jimi Hendrix, versus the mythos. And the climax of the adventure was Gary Gygax versus Richard Nixon in a board game. Oh, jeez. And in the way that I opted to play the board game out, we broke the universe. <laughs> which led to the only possible solution, which was Jimi Hendrix playing the song to fix the universe. Nice. Well, that's, um, hey, if Slim Whitman can save us from the Martian, Jimi Hendrix can play and save the universe. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> or that jingle maker from uh, the One Tree Out of Horror. Not off the top of my head. And, and all the like mascots and everything, and we're attacking the town, and it kind of like it. They're advertising. They only exist if you pay attention. So just ignore it. Nice. Just ignore the rampant destruction and death. But, um, so we've gone a little bit over 7.30, which we had checked with the station was okay before that we did it, and we can actually go a little longer yet. Um, John, if you're okay, I was actually probably going to let you go at this point. Just, okay. Uh, thank you for coming on. You were a great guest, as always. Yeah, nice talking thank to you. you. Thank, you for, thank you for inviting me. I'll, I'll flip this idea to you as well. I think at some point... Um, and I talked to Patrick, and he's agreed. I'd love to have you and Patrick and do a show with the three, with you, both of you at the same time. That sounds like fun. Okay, awesome. Thank, thanks again, um, and have a good night, John. You too. Thank, good night to all of you. Bye bye. So, we got some time yet. Um, I want to start by opening up, reminding everybody the lines are open. Uh, 609-807-2492, 609-807-2492. Folks, um, there's also a Facebook page where and, people can post comments and questions. Yes. Those of you who are watching on Facebook, I know some friends of mine are. Um, if you're a little shy about calling in, feel free to ask me a question over Facebook. I'm happy to take answers. Um, I do have word that we are actually working on having a chat room for the show, just like some of you listened back in the old, the good old days when it was Blue Jet Tilly Show. We had the chat room going. Um, I'm thinking ideally down the road we'll get the three of us set up with laptops so we can interact with people in chat as well as over the air. Yeah, I need to remember where I put my laptop. It's, it's in the back of the car. I know. I've seen I, it a couple of times. I know it's that that much is there. It's just I'm going to need it for Saturday anyway. Yeah. It's, it's in the car. We can find it. I mean, what is a techno wizard without some piece of technology? <laughs> we do a, for anyone who's wondering what she's talking about, the three of us do a vampire work on the first Saturday of every month? Yes. Uh, Mind's Eye Society. Uh, it's at the Princeton Meadows uh, Church and Event Center. Uh, it's a good game. Come out if uh, you have any interest in that and you live in the New Jersey area. I'll also point out that um, my character for that is a magician, and since I'm actually a magician myself, if you come out and get to see me uh, putz around with a couple of my tricks, I think at some point down the road, maybe since this is videotaped as well as audio, I'll have to bring in my box of toys and do some stuff. And if you're there for the werewolf portion, you'll, you'll see me handing everybody pixie sticks. Yes. <laughs> Free sugar if you come out. I also want to plug a couple of th other things that are going on. So um, if you all remember from the very first show that we did, my friend um, Arthur Moyer, had, who will be a guest one of these days, 
has a, show, uh, a convention coming this weekend called The Crucible, uh, which is a magician's type, a magician in the occult paranormal wizard sense kind of thing, instead of a sage magician type thing like me. Um, it's a very good event. I've been there. It has, usually has some very interesting speakers. Um, for that matter, not this weekend, but the following weekend. So yes, Friday, October 13th, yeah. um, I will be speaking at Halloween in the Catskills. Uh, we're going to do a trio of very fun things. And then the following weekend, I will once again be speaking at Halloween with the Catskills, and Brian will be there with me as well. I'll be selling my, my awesome vampire books. Come out and buy them. <laughs> I've read his books. They're actually quite good. Yeah. Um, I will say with Catskills, to give a little bit of a tease about what's going on, I'm going to be doing a live version of the YouTube, so you can come and ask questions in person and get it online if you, if you dare. Yes. Uh, both weekends. I'm also going to be doing um, an EVP session, which will probably be a very smaller scale thing, just because it's definitely the sort of thing you don't want 50 people in the room to try to do audio recording with spirit voices. And then we're going to do a, a creepypasta ritual called 100 Candles, where we're going to light 100 candles. We're going to use um, LED candles instead of actual candles, because I have no desire to burn this wonderful resort to the ground. Um, you tell the ghost story, you put out a candle. When you tell the last story, you put out the last candle, supposedly a ghost will appear. Um, we did this last year. It was very popular and very successful. I'm going to be re restricting everybody to two minutes. And here's the, kind of the cool thing. I'm, this is not, I'm going to tell 100 ghost stories. Not that I couldn't. I probably could come up with 100 stories if I tried hard enough. But I don't want to listen to myself talk that for four or five hours too often. So I'm going to open it up and let anyone who wants to tell a story, as long as you can keep it short, you can tell your own story. You can make it up. Um, last year we had somebody read a snippet from The Raven. It's an enormous amount of fun. Um, I, can't, I certainly cannot promise that we'll get a ghost. Last year we didn't. But, you know, the way I look at it, if you don't get a ghost, you spend the, a couple the ghost got bored listening to all the stories. <laughs> That's also a possibility. But if we don't get a ghost, the reality is you sit in the dark and you tell a bunch of cool ghost stories. And I think that's personally kind of awesome. Yeah. It's got kind of, to me at least, it had kind of that campfire setting. Yeah. Um, also, if you want to do Halloween in the Catskills, it's 150 bucks for the whole weekend. And that's room, admission, and food. It's actually a really good deal. Yeah, that's a phenomenal deal for a convention. You just have to drive like three yeah, it's hours the, into the middle of freaking nowhere. Yeah, it's the Catskills <laughs> Resort in the Catskills. Yeah, in the Catskills. It's you the would, best part of nowhere. If you, enjoy, Halloween, if so. you enjoy bowling with leprechauns, come to the Catskills. <laughs> <laughs> a little, little shout out to... Uh, Did Washington. that story happen in the Catskills? Yes, Washington Irving set uh, Rump... Uh, not Rump. Jack... Rip Van Winkle. Rip Van Winkle was in the, uh, the Catskill Mountains. First... I hadn't realized the story was Washington Irving. Otherwise, it would have been obvious since he said everything. He was from the Cats. Well, that's, yeah, that's where he lived. So, yeah, it was upstate New York. Okay, so Point Sleepy Hollow is up that way. Yep. Hey, Kevin, yeah. we got a question for you. What is a demonologist everybody wants to know? Ah, okay. There we go. That's always a good question. So, I'm, um, I did, when I did the lecture this weekend, I went over it, but I'll go through it in, in detail here. So, in my opinion, there are... Four categories of people that investigate the paranormal. Um, and I, I'm not saying better... Okay, to the point I'm saying some are better than others. But let me go through the four, and I think that clarifies pretty well what a demonologist is. So the, the beginning point, as you, if you will, is what I call a ghost hunter. Um, and I don't mean to demean people that are ghost hunters, but to me, if you're just a ghost hunter, you're... you're the guy who goes out to see a ghost. You know, it, it's sort of where I put the, the high school kid who goes out to the cemetery with the Ouija board. It's where I put most of, the, you know, most of the people that are just running around looking to see a ghost. And that's all they want. And Again, you know, I, I have a respect for that curiosity. But the next step up, I think, is a little better. Right? Is better. Oh, the, the, all the other steps I would say are better. 
But the next step up is what I call a paranormal investigator. Now, a paranormal investigator is somebody, okay, I've had the experience. I've seen the ghost. I want evidence. I want to photograph it. I want to get an audio recording of its voice. I want something I could show somebody else. I want to try to prove that spirits exist. Now, I am a, I, I, I am a paranormal investigator secondary to being a demonologist, so I have a lot of respect for this mindset. I think that desire to learn new things and to understand the world around us is a very noble goal. So I'm not, you know, bad-mouthing these people at all. So the next step up from that is what's, what, I call, what you call a parapsychologist. Um, a, a parapsychologist is very similar to a paranormal investigator. They're both somebody seeking evidence of the paranormal. Um, a lot of parapsychologists, although not all of them, focus more on psychic phenomena than hauntings. Like the um, beginning of Ghostbusters. Yes, the beginning of Ghostbusters. The, the, the original one. The original Ghostbusters is actually the Zenir telepathy test, which is from classic parapsychology. What makes a parapsychologist different from the paranormal investigator is a, to properly be a parapsychologist, and I am not a parapsychologist, you have a degree. Not in the United States, for the most part, you don't have a degree in parapsychology because there are there are a couple of parapsychology departments around, and there is one or two still attached universities. But as far as I know, you can't. Not, there are may, maybe one or two degree programs with a specific focus of parapsychology. Yeah, sadly, pair shit shut down. That was one of the most interesting. Have you heard of that one from Princeton University? I've heard of it. Right, yeah. right in our backyard, but really interesting paranormal program. But it's somebody with a degree that. in psychology mm -hmm. or in physics. Mm -hmm. It's an academic person with those kind of credentials that the paranormal investigator just doesn't have. There's, there's that ghost. Mm -hmm. messing with us now. So the, then we get to number four, which is demonologists and people like me. Say. Um, now, like parapsychology, Schools don't generally offer doctorates in demonology. Um, a number, unlike parapsychology, a number of mainstream seminaries certainly teach classes in the subject. Um, it's hard to become a properly seminary trained priest without learning at least a bit of demonology. It's in your job description. Um, but generally speaking, again, you, you don't have somebody who has, you know, I am a PhD in demonology. A demonologist is, a, is like a paranormal investigator. We're out there to find evidence of the paranormal. What makes us different is we're a para, normally a paranormal investigator or a parapsychologist, and there are certainly exceptions to this, gathers evidence to prove something, and that's their main job. And many of them will also go to psychics and things like that and try to do some sort of moving on to help the spirit go on to the other side. I'm the guy who's getting me the evidence, determining, okay, I'm, when I'm in a house, I'm asking three questions. Is the house actually haunted? Okay, if the house, house is haunted, is it a violent spirit? Is, there, is this something that is actually a threat to the person that's living there? And then the question number three, if the first two are yes, is okay, what are we going to do about it? Um, what makes me un different than the other groups is I work with priests and member of the, members of the clergy to, to get exorcisms performed, to get house blessings performed. Um, most paranormal, and there are, again, there are many exceptions to this, but a lot of the paranormal investigators I know, including some very good people who I have enormous respect for, are not trained and not experienced in what to do with a violent haunting. That's the big difference, is where, nor, where ghost hunters and paranormal investigators often come to me if they don't, because, okay, this thing is throwing plates at somebody and they're afraid of it for their life, and it's outside of their realm of experience and outside of what they've been trained to do, they'll come to me because this is what I specialize with. Um, my mentor, the late Lou Gentili, used to describe the difference pretty well, in my opinion. You know, to paraphrase and use my own words to some extent, paranormal investigators, ghost hunters, and even parapsychologists are the people you call when you hear footsteps in the hallway at night. I'm the guy you call because you're in a hotel room because you won't go back into your house. You're that scared. Um, I think that probably pretty well answers the question. If they have any questions or further clarification, feel free to ask. Um, yeah. I was just going to say, um, I 
say a, 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 there's also the whole thing about there are three types of people who would call themselves demonologists. Oh, absolutely right. Yes. So there are, broadly speaking, three categories of demonologists. Um, in my experience, there may be more. I may be wrong. Actually, arguably, I think I could even say there are four. But the, the most basic kind that you actually will find in academic settings is anthropo it's a subsection of anthropology or and folklore and mythology where they're they they don't they may or may not believe in demons but their main job is studying the like you know the Christian or the Babylonian or the Greek legends about them. They're not interested in contemporary cases. They're interested in as a subsection of anthropology and understanding it from ac academic sense. See previous comments about the fact that I have huge respect for people that are in it for the knowledge. So I'm not, again, I'm not bad at that. Um, the, then there's the people like me that are out there to help people. And are working with God and working with religion and working in a positive sense. And again, and it's a common theme I try to talk about here. I'm not here to tell you you have to convert to Christianity. I work with people of other faiths. I'm not here to disrespect other people of faith. Just, this is what works for me. But there is the other two groups who I tend to clean up after a lot. Um, one is Satanists, black magicians, devil worshippers, people who summon demons for the purpose of their own personal power to cast curses on others. Um, and there, there are Scar they could be a very scary bunch, and I think probably after this I'll get into a discussion about sa about the different three different types of Satanism. Although actually, yet again, I think there's four. Now that I think about it, although one's a subsection of the other, one of the others. But and then there's the other group, which is very, which is the well-meaning black magician. Um, there's an incident I was involved in quite recently, and the investigator who asked who brought it to my attention and, and I had helped advise, because, again, uh, Chuck's a really good investigator. I have a huge amount of respect for the man, but demonology is not his area of expertise. Um, he's, a, he's a Reiki practitioner. He's, and from every